Welcome to Talking Business, a podcast produced in Melbourne, Australia. The podcast is available on the ACAST site, my own website, the Apple Podcast Store, or wherever you go to get your podcasts. Or you can get it at the Business Acumen website at www.businessacumen.biz. I am Leon Gettler. My job is to review and monitor the week's news in business, finance and economics. I bring it all to you every week. This is episode number 30 in our series for 2022, and today's date is Friday, August the 26th. First, I'll be talking to Frank Meehan, the Managing Director of Fiscal Note, the leading technology provider of global policy and market intelligence, next generation carbon and ESG management software solutions. And I'll be talking to Indeed economist Callum Pickering about the latest unemployment and wages figures. But now let's talk to Frank Meehan. Frank, tell us about Fiscal Note and your market intelligence, next generation carbon and ESG management software solution. Sure, absolutely, Leon. So, so Fiscal Note is, uh, has just gone public, actually. We just had our IPO last week uh, on the New York Stock Exchange. So when I uh, went on the NYC as a $1.1 billion company, uh, we're predominantly focused on policy, regulations, uh, software and services globally with about like about 800 employees, about 3,000 plus enterprise and government clients, predominantly in the US, but also quite a lot across Asia and some in Europe. And ESG solutions business is rapidly growing. So we're the leading provider of ESG and regulatory and policy information to US companies from a software perspective uh, and, and a regulatory perspective. So, and now we're bringing it down to, to Australia. How important is ESG for investors? Well, I mean, Len, as you know, it's uh, it's getting it's getting more and more important. I mean, the, everything is actually driven so heavily uh, over the last few years by BlackRock and and Blackstone and, and other the big you know Fidelity, the biggest investors. You know, before government regulation, it was all driven by investors because they could see what was happening, right? I mean, it, it actually you know it's seen kind of what had happened during the digital transformation, where you know about fifty percent of the the global five hundred. Global Fortune 500 disappeared during the digital transformation. They could see exactly the same thing was going to happen during the climate and ESG transition, that companies who didn't end up being sustainable were just going to end up having such huge cost overhangs that they were going to end up you know, disappearing. So you know, a couple of years ago, the, the screws really started to be placed onto a large cap public companies in the US and Europe. And then those companies, you had less big investor pressure, particularly from BlackRock. So those guys are like, well, you know, BlackRock's saying, I want to know your scope one, scope two, scope three emissions, wider ESG. Uh, I want to know that right down your supply chain. So then those big companies, the Apples and Microsoft started putting huge pressure on their supply suppliers to provide that information. That ripple effect is what you've seen the last two years in terms of a much greater focus on corporate carbon emissions and ESG. So it's very important to investors. One of the big issues with ESG is how the level of corporate resp- uh, and, and businesses actually reporting on it. And there's a lot of concern that stuff that they're reporting on isn't actually quite right. And the regulators have come down very hard. What's your view about that? That's right. I mean, you know, initially, you know, for up till about two, three years ago, you know, the carbon reporting was, you know, is done on a yearly basis by consultants uh, and it was done on Excel. Uh, and it was done pretty haphazardly on Excel, and there wasn't really any audit checks as to, onto the numbers. There was sort of like, a, uh, and it was it took ages to gather in the information, and there wasn't really audit trails or anything around that or verification of those numbers happening. And a lot of those numbers just weren't weren't accurate. And so a couple of years ago, you started having a rise of software, right? Because you needed to manage this correctly, especially as you started getting you know, the SEC and the European regulators really cracking down on the numbers, right? The numbers are not accurate. So, uh, and you guys will have to now stand up against these numbers. You'll have to be audited against these numbers, right? And of course, the SEC has now come out this year with very heavy regulations proposed at the moment, but they will go through on on these, these, uh, you know, on the disclosures. So, that's where software has come up uh, to start to help the companies verify things and connect their data across the chain. And it's really going to become as essential as a financial system for them, right? You know, finance is run very well inside companies. The, the carbon reporting and ESG reporting wasn't. And so it's really going to become very software driven, the same as finance is to, to make sure those numbers are accurate. The software would be critical for it. Yeah, it has to be. I mean, you know, you've got the large, I mean, so we're working with large corporates with multinational operations. And, um, and, and the thing about carbon is that you need to know everything, right? You've got to know transport. You've got to go know the electricity. You've got to know waste, you know, water, you know, everything. 
you know, how the buildings are, are, are constructed, you know, what's the, you know, suppliers and supply chain. And so that's, that's just a huge task that is beyond the realm of Excel and consultants, you know, which you, we do have specialists, we have great specialist teams, but now backed by sophisticated software. And, uh, and a growing number of firms are now moving into the space. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very, very hot space and for a software manufacturer. And we do much more than carbon. So you have, basically it's in two areas right now. You have the carbon specialists, just do carbon, uh, and a growing next generation is, is beyond that, right? So we're the next generation that are, are looking that have carbon, but we also do water, we do biodiversity, we do social, we do governance, et cetera, because what happened, we started just in carbon and the big corporates were like, right, well, we need to do our water. We've got to figure out our biodiversity impact. We've got to look at our social impact, supply chain impact. Guys, can you just you know add more and more on? And and so next generation tools move beyond just carbon to becoming you know much more focused at all the other things that you have to like look at from an environmental or social or governance impact. One of the key issues now has been COVID, and that has affected reporting generally, and it would affect things like supply chains, and it would affect connectedness of companies around the world. How does that impact on you? Yeah, well, supply chain has become a, a massive issue for, for companies, obviously. The reporting of it doesn't really impact us as in getting those goods made and shipped has been the major problem for supply chain. But the reporting of what you're actually making and shipping is still is still able to, you're still able to do that. So there is that. But But what's definitely happened is that companies are much more wise to supply chain issues that may affect them, right? So they can't have, so... Like a supplier may say, hey, you know, I don't have um, I, a labor force problem. No, it's, I'm totally fine. Or I don't have a, a water, you know, environment problem. But we now have a sophisticated AI engine and as do some other players in the market that basically scrapes articles and looks at any news stories or any social articles or, so, or social things, mentions about that company and says, uh, you know, actually, there's about, you know, 15 news articles here that say you do have a labor force problem. So you can't hide away from this stuff anymore. And that kind of like verification down supply chain, not just relying on what the suppliers are saying, but ver independently verifying that through, you know, AI, et cetera, machine learning on on, um, on external published reports is, is kicking in as well. So basically companies can't avoid any of this. No, they can't. They've got to benchmark themselves. Uh, you know, we have a, we've now actually added a really um, sophisticated ESG benchmarking tool where they can benchmark their operations, benchmark their suppliers, benchmark their competitors, you know, identify any risks. Um, but I mean, if you look at those SEC regulations, I mean, that are coming up, they're very onerous, right? I mean, that's like, you know, you're basically looking at scope one, scope two, scope three. You have to look at climate impact on your operations. You've got to look at, decarbonization strategies, you've got to have a strategy. And that's actually pushing US companies very far ahead, faster than they were beforehand, almost beyond European companies now who had taken the lead. Companies in Asia are obviously way behind that right now, except for some far-sighted ones like, you know, Fortescue, who had like, you know, grappled with this earlier than others. But yeah, I mean, companies really have to get moving. The issue though, too, is that now that the technology is in place to monitor this. And to yes, make sure that's that right. Yeah, that's right. I mean, and, um, you know, and verify it, uh, you know, and especially, especially when you're looking at ag and mining, you know, they're much more sophisticated tools, satellite, obviously, as well to, to monitor, you know, things as well. I mean, you're, the people who uh, subscribe to your service, uh, what, what sectors would they be in? So they're large, mid to large enterprise um, initially, uh, you know, we focus on there. We don't really, you know, don't really focus on the smaller companies at the moment because the, what we do is pretty sophisticated. So we, we do tend to focus on the medium to bigger ones. So large agriculture companies, logistics, you know, shipping, mining, you know, ones that have a lot of impact up and down supply chain, right? So, you know, anyone who might be supplying you know, an Ikea, for instance, or a Microsoft or an Apple or, or someone in Europe is, is suddenly, you know, really having to provide some pretty detailed information about what their, um, you know, how they, how they mined it or how they shipped it or how they made it or how they, you know, farmed it. Would, would there be scope for other sectors that look like financial services and banks to move in there? 
Yeah, I mean, a little, well, so what's, so the opposite is what happened with financial services and banks. So a lot of the financing now, you know, if you're getting loans, even, especially out in Asia, out of Singapore, is uh, are linked to ESG targets. So you've got like, uh, I will provide the financing to you on the basis that you make some reductions in your in your carbon output or carbon footprint, or you like improve your ESG reporting, and the interest rates on those on that financing is linked to those targets. So you know some pretty heavy incentives now for companies with financing to to take advantage of. Now now the banks are at the same time struggling to you know they're setting those targets, but then they're struggling to get the data and verify that the company is telling them the truth about what the what they're hitting for those targets. So the banks are getting much more involved in figuring, trying to help, trying to actually more help their customers on this reporting. So we, you know, we're working with a, a big bank in the US where it's got like mid market customers, are companies, um, it's helping them with their ESG reporting and improving things. Um, so it's actually taking a much more active role than it would have beforehand. Well, Frank, that's all fascinating. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Leon. And now let's talk to Indeed economist, Callum Pickering. Callum, the latest unemployment figures show we're down to 3.4% unemployment, but we've lost 40,900 jobs. Yeah, it was a bit of an odd one in July. Um, so, so typically when uh, employment falls, you would expect the unemployment rate to rise. Um, but that certainly wasn't the case in, in July. As you said, unemployment rate down to 3.4%. That's the lowest we've seen since September 1974. Um, but unfortunately, uh, it was driven by a decline in participation in the workforce, uh, with employment falling by uh, 40,900 people and unemployment also falling by about 20,000 people. So when you sort of put all those pieces together, uh, it resulted in the unemployment rate um, declining a little bit down to 3.4%. But unfortunately, like I said, it's a bit hard to be uh, too positive about it when you consider uh, what happened with employment. Is this uh, a sign the cracks are being to show across the Australian labour market? I think it's too early to say that. Um, and the main reason I think that is because most of the forward-looking uh, measures of labour market conditions, such as job vacancies, continue to point towards a tightening of the labour market. So I think this July result is probably going to be a bit of a one-off. I would certainly expect employment to rebound when the August figures come out. Um, and I do think that the unemployment rate is likely to uh, drift a little bit lower than the 3.4% the current rate that we, we have. Um, so I, I do think that while the labour market is likely to slow at some point over the next 12 months, I don't think it's going to take place over the next, say, three to four months. Um, because again, all the forward-looking measures we have are, are just so positive right now. They indicate that there's a huge demand for workers nationwide. Uh, across most occupations, most industries, and it would be highly unusual for the labour market to soften while that is the case. But given that, in, you've got uh, inflation rising so high, wouldn't it make sense for Australian workers to explore options to get big pay rises? Well, that's another thing. Um, it, it's certainly a very uh, friendly labour market right now for job seekers. You know, they have a lot of control over where and how they work. They're in a good position to bargain for higher wages. So if, if workers are out there and they are struggling a little bit with cost of, of living pressures, and I imagine there's probably millions of people out there right now um, that sort of fit into that category, it would make sense to consider new opportunities that are out there because we, we know from, from history that often the best way to get the big pay rise is to change employers. If you're working at this in the same job, you might be getting a 2 or a 3% pay rise each year. But if you jump ship, go to a new new workplace, you can often get a, a 10, 15, 20% pay rise. So it does make a lot of sense to consider your options in the current uh, job market where there are relatively few job seekers competing for these roles but there is just so many job opportunities out there. So you can, you know, you, you're really in a great position there to, to bargain for exactly what you want. Which uh, could actually push inflation up higher, potentially. Uh, well, p potentially, yeah. I mean, wages is often, is obviously a driver of inflation. Um, it hasn't been a big driver of the, the current inflation spike, but we do expect at some point that stronger wage growth is going to begin to contribute more to inflation. And of course, if uh, job mobility does increase and, and more people are considering uh, new workplaces and employers, then that could certainly uh, contribute to stronger wage growth nationally and, and obviously higher inflation as well. Well, what was interesting with the pay, with the 
wages figures this week. Baseline pay packets rose 2.6% over the year to June. Um, that means real wages slumped 3.5% over the year. Take into account inflation. Yeah, it was a bit of a mixed bag on the uh, the wages front. So the 2.6% annual increase in wages was the highest in eight years. So normally we'd be wanting to celebrate that. Uh, but unfortunately, with uh, inflation running at 6.1%, it actually means that inflation-adjusted wages have fallen by 3.3%. And that is the biggest decline in wages in, uh, well, on record, actually. So we're, we're looking at at least several generations. Um, so it's actually pretty tough for households right now. The purchasing power of their salary has, has gone backwards quite considerably, um, and they can't buy as many goods and services as they could 12 months ago. And it certainly looks as though uh, real wages are going to continue to decline at least uh, over the, the next six to 12 months while inflation is running so hot. How long will it take till wages get to a normal level or a good level? Well, there is some, some good news on this front. So the way wage growth on a quarterly basis is, is calculated uh, depends on two things. It's the share of jobs that have changing wages and also the average pay increase that those jobs get. So in the June quarter, 14% uh, of jobs had a change in wages. And among those jobs, the average pay increase was 3.8%, which is obviously well above the 2.6% the annual uh, wage growth that we had for the, for the nation as a whole. Now, what that means is that uh, wage pressures are beginning to mount. You know, they're beginning to increase. We're seeing greater competition among employers to uh, attract new talent, but also retain existing workers. Um, and that's triggering the, the higher wage growth that we are seeing. Now, in the September quarter, about 40% of jobs will experience some change in wages, right? It's a new financial year. You often get, you know, a change in wages around that time. Now, if we continue to see the same average pay increases, so that 3.8% in the September quarter, what's going to happen is that national wage growth is going to exceed 3%. And that'll be the first time that's happened in a decade, okay? So we could be three, maybe six months at the most for, from seeing some actually pretty impressive wage growth um, nationwide. Now, it's not going to be enough to offset inflation, but that's that's pretty unrealistic at, at this point in time. You know, we've never seen wage growth of of 6%, um, but we're certainly heading in the right direction and we're going to start seeing nationwide wage growth that we haven't seen in, in over a decade. Um, so we're certainly moving in the right direction. Just back on the uh, job numbers, uh, it seemed that Australian worked, Australians worked fewer hours in July than a month earlier. Would that be right? Yeah, that's right. Um, hours worked have been impacted by several factors uh, in July, and, and one of those factors continues to be COVID. So 5.5% of the Australian workforce worked fewer than normal hours because they were taking sick leave or uh, they were experiencing an illness. And that compares to 3.3% of workers in July last year, just for comparison. We've seen this heightened usage of sick leave and, and illness beginning from January, and that was when we decided we were going to, to live with COVID rather than try and contain it by economic restrictions. Um, so that's been an, an issue that we've had now for the past uh, seven months. Another factor in July was that more people than usual were taking holidays. Um, so obviously borders are open, people can travel a little bit more freely, and Australians were taking advantage of that. 11.6% of Australians took uh, annual leave or, or went on holiday in July, and that's up from about 10% last year. So there's multiple factors driving uh, hours work down, very negative, one being the impact of COVID. A rather positive story, though, being that more people are, are taking holidays um, and sort of enjoying their, their time off. And uh, what implications does these jobs figures have for the RBA and the wages figures for that? Matter? Well, I think... I don't think the RBA would be too concerned with the fall in employment. I, I think they are going to view that as being more a one-off because employment growth has been so strong um, since the beginning of the year. I also think the RBA would view it as, as it likely that employment will rebound in August. They'd be looking at those forward-looking measures and, and how positive they are, and I think they would believe that the uh, labour market is likely to tighten a little bit over the next three months before softening maybe towards the end of the year or in early 2023. The wage figures would generally be viewed pretty positive, positively from the RBA. They would welcome wages continuing to pick up, even though it does have implications for inflation. So, so overall, I think 
that the RBA isn't going to be too influenced by these labour market figures. I think they are likely to increase rates by 50 basis points when they meet in September. I think the cash rate is likely headed to at least 3% by the end of the year. And I think the RBA can move forward with some confidence that the labour market is still relatively strong at this point in time. And do you see it peaking? Beyond 3%? Well, the market's pricing in a cash rate of around 3.5% at some point next year. Now, obviously, that's, that's pretty far into the, into the future and a lot can change between now and then. The, the key question, I guess, is how persistent is this high inflation episode that we're going through? It's being driven by overseas factors, supply chain disruptions, high commodity prices. The, the key for me is just how persistent these, these factors end up being. And we're in a situation where we could see these inflation drivers sort of diminish quite significantly at some point over the next six months. And if that was the case, then inflation is going to come back towards the RBA's target quite quickly. But on the other hand, if these inflation drivers prove to be more persistent than policymakers anticipate, then we're going to see high inflation over the course of, of next year. And that could warrant a, a bigger monetary uh, policy response, uh, particularly if the economy continues to hold up. If the economy is still doing relatively well, but inflation is very high, then the RBA is going to know that it can lift rates with confidence because it's not going to tip the economy into a downturn or recession. So there's a lot of uncertainty around monetary policy at the moment. I think we can be pretty confident that the cash rate's headed towards 3% by year end. But beyond that point, it becomes very difficult to predict what the RBA is likely to do just because there is so much uncertainty around inflation. Well, Callum, that's all quite illuminating. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you, Leon. So what's happening in the news? Well, Australia's rapid-fire interest rate increases are sending tremors through the nation's heavily indebted households and threatening a property downturn on a scale unseen since the eve of the 1991 recession. The market hardest hit is Bellwether, Sydney, where home values have dropped almost 5% in the past three months, compared with 2% in the $9.9 trillion national market. Further falls are inevitable, as Reserve Bank, which meets again in just under two weeks, raises borrowing costs at the fastest pace in a generation. Home prices are weakening from Stockholm to San Francisco as central banks scramble to contain the hottest inflation in decades. Rate height risks are intensified in Australia by a record debt-to-income ratio of 187.2%. The RBA acknowledges it has only a narrow path to push rates high enough to snuff out excess inflation without driving the economy into recession. The Bank of Korea is grappling with a similar conundrum as it meets on Thursday, while the Federal Reserve has signalled flexibility on future rate moves. And News Corp co-chairman Lachlan Murdoch has filed defamation proceedings against Crikey over an article naming his family as unindicted co-conspirators of former US President Donald Trump following the deadly 2021 US Capitol riots. Lawyers for Murdoch, the chief executive of Fox Corporation, filed a statement of claim against the online news outlet in the federal court in Sydney on late on Tuesday, after Crikey challenged the billionaire media mogul on Monday to sue it over the June 29 article. The lawsuit may prove the first major test of new defamation laws in force across most of Australia that include a public interest style defence aimed at protecting investigative journalism and a requirement for prospective plaintiff to show a publication has caused, or is likely to cause, serious harm to their reputation. The latter is aimed at weeding out trivial claims before a trial. A new Productivity Commission report has endorsed skilled migration as a solution to Australia's shortage of tech-savvy workers to resolve the country's slow internet speeds and low uptake of innovative technologies, which contributing to lacklustre rates of productivity growth. The Productivity Commission's second interim report in, in its five-year review into the nation's productivity performance, titled Australia's Data and Digital Dividend, says digital technologies such as artificial intelligence and robotic automation can revolutionise how businesses operate, but a range of barriers such as a lack of skills for businesses and inadequate internet speeds were limiting uptake. The report says governments have a role to play in facilitating better use of technology by bringing in skilled migrants with experience in cutting-edge digital technologies. The Productivity Commission says more jobs will be created in digital technology over the next 10 years than could be filled by local applicants, even on the most optimistic estimates of Australians completing domestic courses through both the vocational education and training system, through a range of the unaccredited vendor providers, and through the university system. Some of the strongest jobs growth will be in areas such as data analytics, cybersecurity and cloud-based services. 
Australia's intake of foreign workers will be a major topic of debate at next week's Skills Summit, with business groups calling for the annual migration intake to increase to at least 200,000 a year for the next two years, up from the present limit of 160,000. The Australian Council of Trade Unions supports expanding the program to 200,000 workers, conditional on the government making other changes to the skilled migration program, including lifting the salary floor for temporary skilled migrants to $90,900 and abolishing visa conditions that tie workers to a single employer. The supermarket majors Coles and Woolworths have been flooded with a record number of demands from suppliers to push through higher shelf prices as food producers grapple with surging inflation. In some cases, suppliers are up to their third round of requests so far this year as they strain onto rising costs. The supermarkets have warned that more demand for price increases are expected in coming months, putting pressure on supermarket shelf prices. The sheer volume of price rise requests, mostly in the past six months, has also seen talks between suppliers and supermarkets pushing out beyond the 30-day window set down by the Industry Code of Conduct. Higher prices come against a backdrop. COVID-19 linked supply chain squeezes, worker shortages, higher energy costs and major flooding across New South Wales and Queensland, which has hurt the nation's food producers. For their part, supermarkets are reluctant to push through rises as shoppers are highly sensitive to price changes. And the price of electric vehicles need to roughly halve and fall into, into the 20,000s range before Australians will switch from traditional combustion engine cars, according to Ampol Chief Executive Matt Halliday. Government policies on, emi- on vehicle emissions efficiencies will do little to shift the dial on uptake rates, he added. Mr Halliday said he expected little change in demand for traditional fuels, such as petrol and diesel, out to 2030, given EVs would not reach price parity with traditional cars until later in the decade. After that point, the impact will become more marked, which Ampol is preparing for with the rollout of its EV charging strategy and its preparations to offer electricity supply. The latter will begin with a limited trial for employees this December half. And Shell is considering developing its own offshore wind projects in Gippsland, intensifying the race between global powerhouses to develop the renewable energy source in, in Victoria. Offshore wind has been earmarked as critical if Australia is to decarbonise and meet its net zero emissions targets, and Victoria has a particularly ambitious target of generating about 20% of its energy needs from offshore wind within a decade. Keen to capitalise, a pipeline of industry heavyweights have announced their own plans to develop offshore wind projects in Gippsland, which is on course to be home to Australia's first offshore wind project. Swelling the number of projects in the pipeline, Shell is understood to be considering two sites in Gippsland for their own uh, own offshore wind project, intensify competition for federal licences. And solar power has outpaced coal as the number one fuel source in the Australian power grid in August for the first time as the energy transition accelerates. While solar generation typically emerges as a dominant source of electricity needs in spring, Energy Edge Marketing Director Joff Stabler said the pattern had never been observed this early in the year. The emergence of solar as a dominant source was first absorbed in August on Friday when it overtook coal for 35 minutes as the biggest fuel source. On Sunday, the period lasted for 3 hours and 20 minutes. At its peak, solar was producing 11,487 megawatts of power, while coal was producing 9,784 megawatts, according to Energy Edge. And the corporate regulator is widening its focus on digital misconduct by prioritising scams and crypto assets as it threatens strong and targeted enforcement action to protect consumers. The Australian Securities Investments Commission released a new corporate plan for the next four years on Monday, highlighting a strategic agenda in the areas of concern. Tackling technology risks was one of the regulator's four key external priorities. This new ASIC plan noted Australia's lost more than $242 million to investment scans in the first half of 2022, cautioning in diverse range of technologies were, were enabling scams. Last year, bank transfers were the most common payment method for scams, with $129 million in losses reported, while 4,730 reports of crypto investment scams were accompanied by $99 million in reported losses. ASIC actions in the crypto industry will include supervising and accessing product disclosure statements of major crypto offerings within the Australian jurisdiction, and implementing a regulatory model for exchange-traded products that have underlying crypto investments. And PwC has fired nine people from the firm for workplace misconduct, including bullying, sexual harassment and data breaches during the past year. The firm investigated 31 allegations in the 2022 financial year, up from 13 the previous year, and substantiated 21 of the complaints. 
the consultant employs about 9,300 staff, meaning the rate of investigation is about 0.33 per 100 staff. The firm substantiated 11 cases relating to bullying, harassment and misconduct, 6 cases of sexual harassment and 4 data breaches. This comes a week after KPMG exited 11 people from the firm for misconduct, including bullying, sexual harassment and policy breaches during the past year. And the Transport Workers Union has called on Qantas CEO Alan Joyce to resign after his airline's apology fell on deaf ears. On Sunday, the embattled airline announced they would be offering frequent flyers a $50 travel credit for a return flight of their choosing. Mr Joyce also acknowledged the end apology to customers acknowledging that their return to flying hasn't gone smoothly. He also announced that the airline had recruited 1,500 staff since April and has adjusted rosters and schedules to overcome a 50% jump in employers taking sick leave. However, the Union National Secretary, Michael Caine, lashed the decision, labelling the move as Alan Joyce at his absolute worst. Instead, he called on the CEO to resign. According to federal government data, the airline lost $1.2 billion in the first half of 2022 financial year, with multiple COVID lockdowns in Sydney and Melbourne to blame. Staffing shortages due to COVID-19 and flu cases has also created challenges for the airline, leading to a request from the airline to ask senior executives and managers to step down from their usual roles to assist ground staff. And the profit reporting season continues. Adbri has reported revenue of $812.4 million for the half year ended June 30, up 8% in the prior corresponding period. Southern Cross Media has posted an FY 2022 net profit down 40.6% to 28,554 on sales down 1.8% to $519.7 million. Ordinate has reported record revenue of US $33.4 million for the 2022 financial year, up 33.4% on FY 21. It also delivered record EBITDA of $44.3 million, up 41% in the prior year. Reliance Worldwide has posted a US $137.4 million net profit after tax for the year ended June 30, down 3% in the prior corresponding period. Chorus has reported revenue of New Zealand $965 million for the 2022 financial year, up from the restated $595 million in FY21. Ampol has reported a statutory net profit after tax of $695.9 million for the six months ended 30 June an increase of 114% on the prior corresponding period. Cooper Energy has reported record revenue of $205.4 million for the 2022 financial year, up 56% on the previous corresponding period. Payments business EML Payments has narrowed its FY 2022 net loss to $4.8 million versus $23.3 million in the prior year period. Event hospitality and entertainment earned a 2020 prof- statutory profit of $53.3 million from a loss in 2021. Adair's delivered underlying EBIT of $76.4 million, down 30% on FY21. Statutory net profit after tax was $44.9 million. NIB Holdings has, has reported underlying revenue of $2.8 billion for the 2022 financial year, up 7.2% on the previous year. Furniture retailer Nick Scarley has posted revenue of $441 million for the year ended 30th June, up 18.2% on the previous year. Boo Media has reported an adjusted net profit after tax was $20.4 million compared with $2.2 million for the previous period. Evita increased 17% to $131.8 million. The Star Entertainment Group reported a 2022 statutory loss of $198.6 million after EBITDA fell 44% to $239.1 million. New Hope has reported underlying EBITDA of $645 million for the quarter following further strengthening of coal prices. Macca's annual profit has trebled to $43 million. The action flick next silver screen revival has seen cinema and hotel operator event hospitality and entertainment record a 43% rise in revenues to $987.8 million. Overall, events earnings rose from $111.1 million to $138.3 million for the 12 months to June 30. And net debt fell to $210.4 million, below pre-pandemic levels. A2B's 2022 revenue increased to 10.4 percent to 125.1 million, and its net loss widened to 27.8 million from 18.1 million without the benefit of JobKeeper and other restructuring costs. Online retailer Kogan.com has posted a 35.5 million dollar loss in FY22, down 1,102 percent from a profit of 3.5 million in FY21. Charter Hall REIT reported a 663.6 million dollar statutory profit. 
owner of lighter liquor chains, Dan, Dan Murphy and BWS Endeavour Group, has booked an 11.2% increase in FY22 net profit to $495 million. Centre Group's operating profit jumped 17.5% to $540.5 million, or 10.4 cents a share. Illumina has reported statutory net profit after tax of US $167.9 million for the, for the half year to 30th of June, compared to $73.6 million in 2021. Boral has reported a statutory net profit after tax of $961 million for the year ended 30th of June 2022. Infection prevention technology company Nanosonics has booked a 57% decline in FY22 net profit after tax to $3.7 million. Residential aged care provider Estia Health has reported net loss after tax of $52.4 million for the year ending 30th of June, compared with a net profit after tax of $5.6 million for the prior year. Hub 24 statutory net profit was up 50% to $14.7 million after $17.9 million was spent on transactions and project costs. Breville's net profit after tax rose 16.2% to $105.7 million. Electronic design software company Altium reported a 57% increase in profit. Ansel reported a 36% drop in net profit after tax to US $158.7 million for 2021-22. Pilbara Metals soared to a maiden half full year profit of $561.8 million on the back of a really strong global demand for lithium raw materials and spodumene concentrate. Iluka Resources had reported net profit after tax of $369 million for the half year to 30th of June, up 186% on the prior corresponding period. Seven Group's Holdings posted a 14.4% increase in net profit after tax to $577.3 million for the full 2022 year, but its statutory impact fell 4.3% to $607.4 million. Tapcor Holdings reported 4.3% loss on revenues to $2.4 billion in FY22 due to COVID. Net profit jumped from $6.7 billion for the full year, up from the $269 million in 2021, but that was largely due to the demerger gain of $6.5 billion. Elmo Software recorded underlying EBITDA of $17.1 million, up $6.5 million on the previous corresponding period. Coles moved supermarket earnings before interest and tax was up at 0.08% to $1.72 billion. Liquor EBIT fell 1.2% to $163 million, and Express EBIT sunk 37.3% to $42 million, selecting travel restrictions throughout the economy. Logistics software company WiseTech Global's profits surged 80% to $194.6 million. Insurance broker AUB Group grew revenues 5.9% and delivered a 14.5% increase in net profits after tax, which reached $80.8 million in the 2022 financial year. Walling posted an 18% increase in underlying earnings to $547 million in FY22. G8 Education has reported a statutory net profit after tax of $8.5 million for the half year ended June 30 down from 23.5 million profit reported in the prior corresponding period. Kelsian's net profit rose 40.1% to 52.9 million for 2022 and revenue 12.9% to $1.32 billion. EBITDA improved 15% to $185.1 million. APA Group reported 3.9% increase in FY22 underlying EBITDA to $1.7 billion. Sonic Healthcare's 2022 net profit rose 11.1% to $1.46 billion and revenue increased 6.7% to $9.34 billion in a record year of earnings on coronavirus testing and overseas growth. And that's it for this week. And next week I'll be talking to videographer Adam Grosowskis from K5 Creative. And I'll be talking to AMP Capital Chief Economist Shane Oliver about the profit reporting season. In the meantime, catch me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn and YouTube. And if you want, leave a comment. Wishing you all the safe.